So welcome everyone to our October Nature Talks. This talk is all about bats. This is our monthly talk and we do this on the first Tuesdays of every month with a rotating team. And this month is bats. I'm Unity Cooper. I'm the Education and Outreach Assistant for Nature Nova Scotia. We are very lucky tonight to be joined by Lori Feeney, Species Iris Biologist at the Misery Tobetic Research Institute, MTRI, as she updates us on current issues on bats locally and what we can do to help them. During this talk, Lori will introduce bats, how special they are, the continuous spread of white nose syndrome, the status of endangered bats in Nova Scotia, and what MTRI is doing to help bats. So folks, if you have any questions, please send it in the chat and Lori and I will try our best to answer all your questions. We will be muting everyone so there's no disruption during the presentation. I am really excited for this presentation tonight because bats are awesome and an important member of the ecosystem in which they live. They help control pests like mosquitoes and pollinate plants so they can produce fruits. Therefore, I'm looking forward to learning more about bats tonight and how we can help them. So Lori, please tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got to MTRI and we can dive right into your presentation. Thanks so much, Unity. Um, hi, everyone. So like Unity said, my name is Lori and I work at the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute and I'm excited for us to chat a bit more about what's going on with bats in Nova Scotia and hopefully answer any of your questions um, that you've been wondering. Um, what's going on with bats right now is probably the question I get asked the most when I talk with people. So i um, always happy to chat about it. Um, a little bit about me. So I um, actually did my master's studying bats. So that's kind of my background and I kind of got in it accidentally just by working at the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute. Uh, so the place I work at is a nonprofit organization located by just down the road from Kejimakujik National Park, which is in Queens County, Nova Scotia, Canada. And so we do a lot of work around conservation and biodiversity. And one of the things we've been doing over the years is trying to look at bats and support partners and projects to, to figure out how they're doing and what's going on. And so sometimes um, we end up going in articles and different things like with CBC, just trying to give those updates on what's going on. So you might have heard about us or me from, from some of the articles over the various years. One of the ones that got up a lot of attention was called the Bat Seekers of Nova Scotia and CBC um, actually came out with us to one of the bat colonies that we're monitoring that's um, still surviving um, in the wake of bat numbers being pretty low right now. So so yeah, if you've heard heard of my workplace or, or me, it might be through an article like this before. So um, so we can't, we, we got to start here. We have to start with what type of bats we have in Nova Scotia. And I think it's really interesting because when we think about seeing bats, most of the time we're saying we saw a bat and we actually don't think about the type of bat that we're seeing. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, the biggest one is that they're active at night when we're usually in bed inside and trying to avoid the mosquitoes. And in opposition, that's their, their time to be alive out thriving at night, feeding on, on bugs. So um, here are some of the bats that have been documented in Nova Scotia before. The top ones are separated from the bottom ones based on two different things. The top ones are bats that are found in Nova Scotia year round, while the bottom ones are either rarely seen or just thought to come here during the summer or during migration. And so actually the bottom ones this time of year, we're kind of expecting to leave Nova Scotia and, and go down south to warmer climates. While the top row of bats, we, we think that they're moving towards the sites that they'll spend the winter, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But um, those are kind of what differentiate the two uh, big groups. Now, the one you're most likely to see or have seen in the past, if you've ever seen a bat, is the little brown bat here. And this is the, the top uh, left-hand one. But of course, you'll notice that some of these bats all just look like small little brown bats from these illustrations. So we'll kind of dive in a little bit more into some of the features that they share, but also um, some of their differences. So with this bat, that if you saw a bat, um, potentially is the one that you are most likely to see. Um, it's actually the most widespread bat across Canada. So I have a map here in the bottom right hand corner that uh, shows where it's found in Canada. So you can see that it's in um, in all the provinces and crosses into um, two of the territories. 
And of course, there's there's new records being found every year of bats being um, more nor in more than more northern latitudes than previously thought. So there's probably things we still don't know about where they're residing. Um, Something about this bat to note though, is it's actually relatively small. So, so often people are thinking that bats are pretty, can be intimidating or being a bit scary or startling. Um, when in reality you can, they're really, they're really quite lightweight and small. So um, a number that people throw around is that they can weigh around the size of a toonie. So seven to nine grams, um, a toonie is pretty light and that makes them pretty good at flying and lightweight to get around. And then for their actual size, like if you were to hold a bat in your palm of your hand, like in this photo here, um, they're, they're really quite small. So if you think about a 30 centimeter, centimeter ruler, that's only about the third of a size of a ruler of their, their length of their body. And then for their wingspan, their wingspan isn't even the full length of, of a ruler. So, so quite small and um, in my opinion, quite cute. <laughs> now, one thing that we love them for and that they love as well is um, they love to eat insects. And that's something that's common throughout all bats found in Canada is that they, they love to eat a variety of insects. Um, so this bat in particular has been known to eat midges, mayflies, moths, beetles. Um, we like to think of them as eating a lot of mosquitoes, which I think they do. Um, maybe not as many as we would like, but they, they eat a variety of, of insects. And they also have a variety of roosting habitats and, and they're known for, for roosting or, or sleeping together um, in, in large groups. So let's dive into where those places might be. So they have different habitat versus the summer and winter. And for the summer, uh, this little bat can be found in a variety of places. It's very adapted, it's adapted to a variety of places. So I actually don't know if there's a place I would say you wouldn't find a bat. <laughs> um, we get lots of reports of people saying they're in their wood pile. Um, there's one on the side of the building in the attic of their, of their shed or their house. Um, but there's a combination of places. Some of those places are uh, man-made or human-made uh, structures, such as a bat box or a barn. And while other ones are natural roosts, and so those natural roosts um, have a few characteristics which I'll cover. They also love to be close to water, which is a feature um, that shouldn't be too surprising because often close to water is where we find um, some of the bugs that drive us a little bit crazy. Uh, so I wanted to show you some cool photos of, of a bat box. Um, I get a lot of questions about that as well, just because people are always trying to figure out their way to be involved with bats and bat conservation. And so of course, um, bats use a variety of places and not all species um, in Nova Scotia are thought to rely on bat boxes or use them regularly. Um, little brown bats are kind of the only species in Nova Scotia we think rely are regularly using them. Of course, in other parts of the world or their range, um, some of those bats I showed you in the photos, they can be found um, using bat boxes. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of focus on this one species since you're most likely to encounter it. Um, but I want to show you these photos just because if you ever do see a bat box, feel free to take a light and a more powerful flashlight is really great or the darker it is, it makes it a bit easier and um, shine it up inside the box and you can check to see if anyone's in there. Um, best time to check is between spring and fall usually. We had a site um, on the weekend that still had one bat inside of it. So it's cooling down quite a bit and they're getting ready to go to their winter sites, but they still could be lingering. And then the photo on the right, I really wanted to show everyone just so that you could see what um, bat poop could look like below your bat box. Um, and it kind of just looks like these black tiny little pellets, similar to mouse poop, um, a bit more dry and usually more in a pile than scattered like a mouse. So those are, so those are some things to look for, some features uh, from uh, human-made structures. But naturally, bats, of course, didn't always have buildings made by humans. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the characteristics that brown little brown bats have been found to use across North America. Uh, so they might use trees um, and different parts of the tree. So it might be crevices, they might be going under the tree bark, but they tend to be found in the upper higher parts of the tree. And so the reason this is important to think about is because if there's bats roosting high up in a tree, it's very hard for us to find them. So that's why often we are more aware of bats roosting in human-made structures versus these natural roosts. A lot of the work we do involves um, working with landowners that are at um, that have colonies of bats actually on their property in human-made structures. And that's the biggest reason for that is because they're easier to find. So unfortunately, there's there's sometimes a bias towards um, bats that are that have adapted to human-made structures. 
The other thing that has been found about where bats like to be naturally in um, the environment are also in places with lots of dead, dead trees or dead snags. So if you're thinking about um, any trees on your property that aren't causing you problems that are aging, um, it's great to leave them and it's good for a variety of, ver uh, a variety of birds as well and, and other animals and things like that. So um, you can add, add bats to your list for, for why keeping older or older trees around is beneficial. So the, the second bullet point I have on here is a summary of what this, this species of bat has been found to like across North America, specifically in Nova Scotia. Um, some of the specific data show they like large diameter trees and, and sometimes older trees. Um, some data says in Atlantic Canada, like the trees in the mid stage of decay, so not, so not super new trees, but some trees that are aging. But of course these can vary throughout the summer. And then it's also really hard to track bats and find where the, what trees are using during the summer. Um, so we, I mentioned about what bats like to, um, like to eat and just cause we're talking right now, just where this bat likes to spend the summer and what is it doing? Most of the time it's out at night feeding on bugs. And so I wanted to show you a video of that if it will work. Maybe it won't. Um, It works. Maybe I'll close my presentation. Hmm. Okay, it's not working. Oh, I would love to show you this video. I wonder why it's not working. It was working like 15 minutes ago. It looks to be a picture right now. Um, maybe at the end of my presentation, I could pull it up on YouTube and show you guys. Um, so it was a really cool video of um, a bat feeding on a moth and catching it and it's quite neat because the bat uses different parts of its body to actually maneuver the insect into its mouth so sometimes the bat is catching it actually they they have like tail pouches some species and so um in the video you can see the bat uh using the tail pouch to swoop a, a moth into its mouth um uh kind of maneuvering sometimes missing insects it's always interesting to see animals mess up because we think that they're so they're so coordinated so yeah i think um if someone wants to remind me at the end if we want to loop back maybe i can find this on youtube bring this back to full screen um so so that's kind of a bit about summer um now for bats during the winter, and this is something for, for the three species of bats that we think over winter here, um, they're starting to do this um, as early as August or September and getting ready to go into their, to make their way over to their overwintering sites. Um, those overwintering sites can be a variety of places as well. Probably not as big a variety as um, what we see during the summer. Um, they're documented in Nova Scotia as using caves and mines. And other places nearby, such as in Atlantic Canada, some species will use buildings, wells, um, a variety of things. Um, there's probably lots to learn. And even out west where we see bats using rock crevices. And so that doesn't mean that's not happening here. We just haven't uh, well documented it yet in Nova Scotia. Um, here on the upper left photo, uh, the cluster of like a few bats in a little hole there that was taken earlier this spring and I thought that was pretty cute to see. Um, some bats surviving post white nose syndrome, um, post what I'll get into, um, kind of clustered together. Now during the summer we're often seeing just female bats together, but a big contrast during the winter is that this can be more mixed. Um, females during the, the summer are actually getting in these big groups to get together and have their young, while males are kind of off and not involved in, in parental care. And so here you'll see more mixed, uh, mixed aggregations of genders. Uh, one thing that very... <laughs> Depending on the species. I forgot to turn on my volume before I started this. Uh, so one thing that might vary a little bit is one of the species that overwinters here, the tricolor bat, is more often seen roosting on its own, while the little brown bat um, generally will roost in clusters. It can roost on its own as well, but um, often the tricolor bat is on its own. So there's a little bit difference between the bats that we most often see in Nova Scotia. Um, and they do, uh, they go into the state of hibernation, specifically called tor, torpor or torpid, and um, 
they're basically their their body temperature is the same as the environment. Um, their heart rate is really low. Their the immune system is really low. Um, a state of conserving energy, and they'll wake up a handful of times usually. Um, that's kind of the average we think for this species, and they'll do it for different things. They might switch spots. They might find a different site. Um, they might urinate. Um, do a different variety of things, and. Um, the biggest part that uses up their energy during the winter is actually just the state of going from from hibernating to waking up. So that uses about 90% of their energy just from waking up. So they're actually not using as much once they're actually awake or when they're they're hibernating. Um, so it's important for bats to not be disturbed. So you can really think about that if you ever go into a cave that the impact of, of someone being there and causing a bat to wake up another time or or whatever can can be um, have a larger impact than you would think on an individual bat. So now that I've given you a good idea of um, kind of just giving you an image of the different species we have here and just focusing on one and kind of pulling out what those features are. So eating insects, different sites during the summer versus winter and getting through the winter in Nova Scotia by hibernating. It's kind of neat to think to what the context of what's been going on with these bats over the years. So um, in uh, 1997, um, I pulled out a quote from a research project by someone named Jason Taylor, who was looking at bat hibernation sites in Nova Scotia. And one of the interesting quotes from his research was that he summarized the state of bat conservation in Nova Scotia as little attention has been placed to bats um, in a historical context. And the reason that's important is because we didn't have a great idea on the number of bats prior to this time. And even now we still struggle with that. And, and we're really gonna cover that today. But it's important to know that back then in 1997, more than 20 years ago, um, like 25 years ago, uh, that we didn't have a great idea on the number of bats. And so bats are hard to study, so it is hard to get the number, but having not enough research was, was kind of something that he was getting at that that was really important. So there was a movement more towards the mid uh, 2000s to get a better understanding. Um, another thing that happened during this time is some of the technology to study and monitor bats got a lot better. So it made it easier for people um, that are bat biologists to actually go out and, and catch the bats or record the bats and do different things to understand what type of bats are in the area and what they were doing and, and some of their behavior and habits. Um, and so in 2003, um, the study kind of uh, by Hugh Broders, which is um, one of the more one of the well known bat researchers in Nova Scotia, he um, documented kind of the more abundant species that can be found here. So the little brown bat, or the little brown myotis, the northern myotis and the tricolor bat. So kind of going from not really knowing what species were really here prior to the 2000s or still needing more research to figure out that and then kind of better documenting it. There was also just this movement towards um, more social concern and pol political awareness about the environment, um, with obviously with nature in Nova Scotia and various groups, um, just more of a movement towards people being really conscious about this. And along with that kind of attitude, um, there was more interest in efforts in documenting and increasing protection for bats. And so this was a really nice time for, for bat research because um, bats, were, bats were plentiful around this time, 2008. Um, and um, there was more, more eagerness to research them and figure out uh, the context of bats in Nova Scotia. Then something crazy happened. Uh, so this is uh, always sad to talk about. Um, it's one of the worst wildlife di diseases in his in modern history. But um, in the picture here, it's a little bit hard to see. I'll pull up some circles. Are lots of dead bats, and you can find some worse photos on the internet where just there's piles of them in the bottoms of caves. And so bat researchers were going into hibernation sites in eastern North America, which first was documented in um, Albany. Um, in New York State, and just finding hundreds of thousands of dead of dead bats, hundreds and thousands. And um, what we've come to know today that a lot of people can say is that all oh, that white fuzzy stuff that bats get it from, and so um, that disease is called white nose syndrome. And there's this culprit behind it. It's a fungus called white nose syndrome, uh, or sorry, the fungus is called Pseudogenonascus destructans. And bat biologists, we like to use a shorter term to make that a little bit easier. So sometimes we'll say PD or white nose syndrome um, as the actual disease name. 
And the reason that it's so bad is because once it invades a site where bats are hibernating, they're in that kind of um, sleepy state basically is a really simplified way to explain it. And it's a great time to attack the bats because they're trying to conserve energy and have their body temperature really low and they're not, their immune system isn't fully active. So they're super vulnerable to this fungus that, that grows at the same temperatures as they like to hibernate and um, just thrives in that environment where bats like to be. The also thing that compacts this is that the fungus can survive in caves without bats, so it can persist in the environment even if they're not there. Coupled with this, uh, bats are quite social. We talked about some of those species that like to roost in groups um, during the summer and during the winter, and so little brown bat is one of those. And um, this just allows the fungus to spread pretty quickly. And some of those specific things that cause problems is that um, when the bats are sick, they're actually waking them up more often to kind of fight the fungus. They're running out of energy, so they actually want to seek out food and water and things like that, which are not very accessible during the winter. And so they really struggle with trying to, to combat the diseases, combat the disease and fight it. This is a really old number, uh, 10 years. 10 years ago, they, they brought a group of people together, a group of experts, and tried to figure out how many bats had died um, between around 2006, 2012. And at that point, it was over 6 million. Um, that number would be a lot higher now. But just to give you context that uh, mil like millions of bats have died in, in very short periods of time. Um, one, some of the numbers are that within the first year of the fungus, um, about 30% of the bats can die in a cave, and then by year two up to 70%, and then a lot of sites we've seen 90 to 100% die off within like two to three years. So, so the takeaway from that is that it's really, um, really quick to um, kill off the bats in, in one site. Now I'm going to give you an idea of the spread of white nose syndrome, and that's one thing I I know that a lot of people are curious, or what's the update on white nose syndrome? You've probably heard of it. You have an idea that bats in Nova Scotia aren't doing well from it, but where is it right now? So I'm going to play you a time lapse of the spread of white nose syndrome. So we have North America here. Um, we're kind of more centralized on this viewpoint of the states, but Canada's up here and Nova Scotia's right here. And I'm just going to press play for you. And this is showing the, the colors are showing the spread of the white nose syndrome over the years. So we started in 2006, we're getting to about 2013. I'm um, sorry, Laurie, I don't think it's playing and we, we can't see your mouse. Oh, okay, good to know. Let, maybe I need to change my screen, new share. Does that work? Yes. Okay, sweet. Okay, so for context, um, I just pulled up the website, whitenosyndrome.org, and this is a web website that you can visit anytime. It has lots of resources on what's going on with bats. Um, this is a map of where the disease that is harming bats really quickly and rapidly um, is mapped out, and so you can find out the latest update on where it is. And so I'm going to show you over the time how quickly does the disease has spread in North America. So we're at 2012, Nova Scotia is right here. You can see that it's quickly um, being mapped out that it's affected bats there. And, and then it's just can quickly, quickly, quickly spreading um, from east to west. And at this point in time, uh, 2022, um, we're about this part of North America to spread to and um, starting to ca cause these kind of really quick declines in some of those places. So really, really crazy and really quick. Um, so feel free to check out this website if you ever want to see an update on where white nose syndrome is in the future and, and also lots of resources on what white nose syndrome is and, and more details. I'll switch to scare sharing my PowerPoint. And so for us, for Canada, um, the most recent news is the spread of white nose syndrome to Siska to Saskatchewan. <laughs> um, so Saskatchewan uh, first documented it actually this year. So that hit news headlines around uh, July and was, was a big deal. Um, we've had the disease for about 10 years now and, and seen really low, low bat numbers from that. And so out West, um, 
those bats in like BC and Alberta and Saskatchewan have yet to have these mass declines and their bat populations are not yet affected by white nose syndrome. Of course, there's other threats that we can, we'll talk lately about today, but uh, it's, uh, it's coming their way and it's, it's something that's probably unavoidable and that they've had to prepare for. And there's been a lot of effort in places that didn't have white nose syndrome um, to monitor their bats while these other places that have been affected are, are seeing the consequences of that. So even though white nose syndrome here has been been around um, for 10 years, there are still bats that are presenting symptoms of the disease. And so this is a picture of a bat I took um, in New Brunswick in April this year. And um, I also want to mention that sometimes you can see a bat and it can have, um, it can be sick from white nose syndrome or have white nose syndrome and have no visible signs. So, so the disease gets its name from have this white fuzzy, fuzzy stuff growing on its face. But of course um, it, uh, does presents in other areas. It actually loves the bare skin of bats. It's a great surface for it to grow on. And uh, yeah, just something to think about that even though um, there are bats maybe persisting a little bit, they're still facing these consequences of this disease. Now there's a few treatments that have been researched. Um, some of them are, are vaccines. Um, some of them are altering caves. Some of them are putting out heated bat boxes. Um, there's a few things that have been looked into and there is currently no solution that has been um, effectively integrated into like management um, to, to help with bats. Um, they just die off so quickly that it's hard to respond. So the best thing that people can do right now in places where white nose syndrome isn't is to actually um, study their bats and really understand their bats so that they can uh, have a good baseline before this happens. Um, we were kind of in with that timeline I showed you, we were just in the stage of kind of getting that really good baseline information on bats in Nova Scotia. So this paper came out really recently, also in July. And one of the, their recommendation that came out of their research was they modeled different treatments. And of course, some of these treatments haven't been widespread implemented or anything. Some of the treatments that I just mentioned have just been tested. And what they did is they looked at all the treatments that have been researched and they tried to figure out um, if any treatments could be effective if they weren't applied early. And what they found is that the uh, using any different solution or treatment, um, if it wasn't done early, it wasn't very, um, it wasn't very effective. So, so the, the kind of the takeaway from this paper was just that early treatment is needed to have an impact um, on the bat population in a certain area. But then there's something else that they talked about was just um, if the disease is well established in an area that um, increasing survival and reproduction through other methods, then disease treatments um, is a better option, most likely. And so we're in that stage. The disease is really well established in Nova Scotia here for years. And so we need to really focus on efforts to increase survival and reproduction um, for our bats in Nova Scotia. <coughs> Some of the other threats that bats face um, are just like changes in their habitat. Um, maybe losing their habitat, degradation, or the quality isn't as um, isn't as uh, as good as they need to thrive. Um, of course, human persecution. So people just misunderstanding bats and not understanding that like a colony of bats in their attic is actually a group of female bats trying to have their young. Um, we tend to think of them as more of pests and maybe categorize them. Um, with rats and rodents and things like that when they're they're so different from those from those animals as well and um, they have a really strong place in our ecosystem to uh, to feed on the to feed on insects of course but uh, they're also just really cool there's a lot of neat things about them that make them unique uh, aside some of those threats um, the more recent ones that have come up are the white nose syndrome which we just talked about but also wind energy development and that issue is um is more something that affects those migratory bats. So one of the first slides I showed you with all the bat species was those bottom ones that kind of are colorful and we don't see very often. Uh, wind energy development is having a bigger impact on them. Um, and white nose syndrome generally isn't affecting those bats because they don't typically hibernate. So they're not going into um, hibernation and, and vulnerable, vulnerable to this fungus that grows in, in caves and mines. Um, something to think about is that uh, with these other threats that are widespread in North America, even places without white nose syndrome um, have these, these impacts to bats. But then once you put white nose syndrome on top, it probably amplifies and magnifies um, 
the various things that bats face and try and live a year as a life in a bat is probably pretty tricky. <laughs> and so bats are listed. Um, they're listed through um, the federal government through their uh, Species at Risk Act and also the Provincial um, Endangered Species Act in Nova Scotia. And this was done immediately after um, we saw these quick declines in Nova Scotia, which took place by, by around 2013. And so they, they have this special protection, and that's because the numbers drop so quick. Um, the estimate is about 95% of our bats died off um, between 2011 and 2013. And to put this in context, um, we think that there was probably tens to hundreds of thousands of these bats before they died off. Um, but of course, we don't actually have an accurate number, and that's just an estimate. So um, if you look up some of the reports um, uh, from trying to put into context how bats are doing, is that each of the myota species, so the little brown bat and the northern long ear bat, um, they estimated likely over a million of these bats in Canada. In Nova Scotia specifically, um, from a report in 2004, um, we thought that maybe there would be about, based off of 15,000 overwintering bats, that maybe there would be 300,000 in, in the province. And not that these specific numbers matter because they're just estimates and we don't know how accurate they are. It's just to say that there was a lot of bats and they were widespread. And I think a lot of you can probably attest to that if you had experiences growing up seeing bats um, regularly in your backyard and now you don't. So um, I think some of our goals right now, um, people asking if bats are gonna bounce back is just to get to that state where it's, it's possible to see a bat on, on a summer night. And just for just to just because it's interesting um, to show you how infrequent we see these other type of bats that come just during the summer, the migratory species. Um, a report from 2011 documented only about 65 records of those three of three species on um, the total: the silver-haired bat, the hoary bat, and the red bat. And so you can just see that huge difference, like tens to hundreds of thousands to um, very few records. Of course, those records are. Uh, just like observations, acoustic recordings, or specimens. So we're probably missing a good chunk, and they could be here more than we we know. And some more research is need is needed to better document these uh, these ones that just visit. The bat that I haven't talked a lot about um, is the big brown bat. This one is becoming more common in New Brunswick, and so we might see it here more often. There's some like old records of maybe them being in caves in Nova Scotia. They were only visual observations and they weren't handling the bat. And of course, these small brown bats can look very similar. So um, we might have had some old records, but it'd be nice to get um, some more recent uh, documentation of this species. I think there was one from the Oxford frozen food plant in 2017. So um, we're going to keep our eye out for this bat over the next 10 years and see if we see them more often here because they are in New Brunswick. Uh, so Bat numbers are low. What were they like before? And how are we going to figure out what bats are doing, how bats are doing now? And that's from people like you who see bats. Um, we're going to collect those sightings. And so we've been doing this since 2013. So we're getting up about 10 years as well. And this website was started by the Mersey Topiatic Research Institute and our partner, um, Nova Scotia Department of Renewable Resources, or DLF, as it was previously called. And so we combine collecting reports either through the phone. We have a species at risk hotline in Nova Scotia, so the numbers here on this poster. As well, um, we created a website so it would make it really easy for people to go online and, and just enter their bat report because of course sometimes you're seeing them at like 10 p.m. or, or 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. and no one's in an office answering a phone then. <laughs> Maybe I should be. <laughs> So I wanted to give you a little update on what we've been seeing with these bat reports um, since we've been collecting sightings for so many years. Um, as of today, in 2022, we've gotten around 370 reports. Um, over the years, I would say we're getting between a few hundred up to five or 600. So I would say this is a little bit low compared to last year, but of course the year isn't done yet. We often get um, a surge of reports in August too. I think um, Bats are more transient or changing locations then, um, and people are seeing them kind of in a variety of places. So here are some photos that we've received to the bat website of people observing bats, bats in a variety of places across Nova Scotia. 
And um, so those photos uh, kind of resemble possibly a little brown bat. And of course, it's really hard to tell what species of bat you're seeing when it's flying around. So these photos are make it a little bit easier to take a guess at that. But most of the time, you're just going to see a bat flying around. That's perfectly OK. That's a majority of the bat reports we get. But it's just more cool to or more interesting to show you photos like this that we get. Sometimes we also get these migratory bats. So on the left here, we have an Eastern red bat. This bat is actually um, deceased, but um, it was able to be sent for testing. And sometimes even these bats can be used for, for specimens in the future to inventory at the museum. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, a silver hood bat. And on the right hand side, we have a hoary bat. So these are reports over the last three years. And it's been really great because we can better document some of those more rare species that maybe are around more than we think. So I definitely encourage any of you, if you see a bat or if you hear someone see, um, hear someone say that they've seen a bat, please pass along that we are collecting those sightings. And now, because this is one of the things that everyone's interested in, is like, what's going on with bats? What are some of the local threats here? And what are some recent bat reports over the past year? Uh, so one of the highlights of the year are a bat report from Ronnie, and he was in uh, Shelburne County. In Nova Scotia in the bottom left hand photo or bottom right hand photo uh, he saw one flying out in the morning um, just early September so not really that long ago and uh, bats are very hard to photograph active at night flying moving fast um, a lot of you probably know that uh, taking birds or anything moving is really difficult so pretty amazing um, you can see these the dark body and the dark wings and uh, more rounded ears than some of the other species of bats I've shown photos photos to you of the other neat report that Ronnie um, uh, was able to document was this photo here. Um, this is actually a Merlin and I have kind of a closer in image. And if you look at the talons here, there's actually a bat inside um, or in the grass of the talons. So uh, really neat to have this documented. I mean, of, of course, sad, but um, uh, really neat to have that documented this predation. So. So I'd like to share with you some of the other mortalities that we've had reported this year. So um, aside this predation event, um, we've had a report of a vehicle collision, which of course can happen. And then um, other incidents of predation have been actually from like domestic cats. Uh, so we encourage people if um, you're looking ways to help bats to keep your cat indoors at dusk and dawn, um, typically when bats are emerging or are kind of coming back to their roost, um, that can really minimize cat predation. And um, uh, we also had some reports of unknown causes of death. So sometimes you'll find a bat dead in, in a shed or a barn or things like that. And it's hard to know what happens. So we can send those away for testing. So if you ever, um, if you ever find a dead bat, you can contact us or contact Department of Natural Resources and, and let them know. Some other updates on local observations and what's going on with bats. So we kind of just covered a few of the threats we've seen in the last few years or the last year. Um, we are continuing to see a surge of bat reports um, where bats are roosting in patio umbrellas in August. And so we would love to receive more of those or if you hear of any of those in the future. We're really interested, we're really interested in documenting this because it isn't well documented. If you do research um, for science and publications, um, there aren't really solid reports on bats using patio umbrellas. And so we'd like to work with um, anyone who's seen a report to document that and potentially put out something. So. Uh, the broader bat community is informed um, or better it's better documented that this is happening. Uh, the last kind of specific update to this year uh, from the bat reports is uh, we found a new a couple new spots or we we partnered with a few new landowners that uh, had bats on their property and so that was pretty exciting. We have a really hard time finding sites where there's maternity colonies of bats. Most of the time the reports are of a single bat flying at night, which is really awesome. And then kind of the next stage we'd like to get to is where people start having these roofs kind of on places on their property and that they can actually monitor them and keep an eye on them and, and count and see how the numbers change over the years. And so some of those bat owner or those landowners with bats on their property, we've actually seen the number of bats on their property increase over the years. So I'd say we have about 10 to 15 landowners that we've been working with, and it's been really exciting for them to kind of see their bat, their bat numbers go from say 50 to one person going up to 150. And of course that's not normal and that's not, not the case for most people, but it's exciting to see a few places and kind of use these as um, places to, to, watch how bats potentially rebound in the future. 
So we're going to get into uh, how you can help bats and that bat reporting website and sharing your information with us. We really appreciate. And of course, no pressure with the photos. Ignore my photos if that makes you feel like you have to report <laughs> your sighting with a photo. Um, there's lots going on. Um, Hugh, Dr. Hugh Broders um, is doing a lot of work to kind of check in on how bats are doing this um, this year and this fall and this winter. And so I don't have any information to share with that, but hopefully in the future we get a better update on the number of bats at some of the overwintering sites, caves, and mines in Hans County. Um, I wonder, I'm curious if any of you have visited them in, in past decades or anything like that. Um, we have monitoring that we do, so we're kind of using those partnerships with landowners to monitor the summer maternity roost of colonies and figure out how they're doing. In 2019 and 2020, we actually had a meeting of all the bat researchers in Atlantic Canada, and it's pretty neat that there's more than you would think for some of the small provinces. And uh, a big development is this program called the North American Bat Monitoring Program. So if you're familiar with other programs such as the Christmas Bird Count or the Breeding Bird Survey or, or just well-established monitoring programs, I know there's things like Frog Watch in Ontario. Um, we were really missing um, a large monitoring program with protocols for bats. And so that's been really developing over the last like 10 years, closer to five probably in the States and it's expanded to Canada and um, it's really growing in, in Atlantic Canada. So the, that is being led by the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. And um, it's really exciting just because this is giving more structure and more resources to people to participate in, in bat monitoring research and conservation. The other thing which I'll share information with you later in my slides is um, how you can report bats in Atlantic Canada. So in the past, um, we've only had the hotline in Nova Scotia. And so that started pretty quickly in 2013, but in the last few years, um, the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative uh, developed a number for anyone in Atlantic Canada to call. So we work closely with them and it's great to have a place to refer to people if they're in like New Brunswick or PEI in Newfoundland. I have some pictures here of some of the special equipment that I, uh, is, is my specialty, um, acoustic equipment where we record the sounds or the echolocations of bats to figure out presence, absence, um, relative abundance and things like that. And so i um, happy to answer any questions about acoustic, uh, acoustic related topics if anyone's um, been looking into that. I'm gonna highlight a few other ways that you can help bats as I wrap up here. Um, one great thing is to promote natural, uh, natural habitat for bats. Um, so that might look like uh, leaving large trees, um, uh, old or dead or dying trees, uh, having a really suitable network of trees for bats. Um, some research shows that bats switch every two to three days and even one day between tree roosts or different roosts that they use. I think the average for like the tricolor bat is around every 2.5 days, they change locations. So they rely on kind of a network of spaces to pick the right temperature, the right spot, the right place to eat um, throughout their summer. Uh, one other thing is to like let there be natural, thriving, healthy insect populations, which I know kind of sounds um, counterintuitive for, for someone who, for people who may not like bats um, or may not like bugs, but also may not like bats, but um, this will allow uh, lots of species to thrive. Um, we have a group of insect eating bugs or e insect eating birds called insectivores. And um, you could actually categorize kind of bats in with uh, with other birds such as like swallows or, or swifts and things like that. And just allow them to eat the bugs. <laughs> Another thing that um, I really try to be conscious of, of sometimes working around bats is just avoid or minimize me disturbing them just because their energy is so important to them. Um, they have a pretty fast metabolism and requires a lot of energy to fly and, and of course raise young and do all these things that they're doing. Some of the huge movements they make between their summer site and winter site. To keep things rolling, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but this is such a cool observation. Um, we didn't have a breeding record of silver-haired bats in Atlantic Canada, and the first one was found in, uh, I think it was 2020, um, in New Brunswick. And the reason I wanted to share this is because they had kind of an old tree that was um, then ended up getting damaged in some bad weather. 
And when they got the tree taken down, they actually found a colony of silver-haired bats. Um, so it was an unfortunate thing that when the tree got taken down, this is how it was discovered. But also this allowed us to learn that this species of bat is breeding in this northern of a latitude. And then it makes me really think about the potential for us to find something like this in Nova Scotia one day and that there's so much more to learn. And bats are just so mysterious. And um, yeah, just working with bats is a uh, is a cool field to be in and there's there's just so much more to learn i'm excited to see where where bat research goes in the next 10 years in advance canada one thing i do want to mention is that if you have bats in a place where you're unsure if you actually want them there that there's lots of resources on how to do that um there's actually a nova scotia guidebook on bats and buildings um, that the canadian wildlife health cooperative and the provincial government work together on and so i definitely re refer you to that if you ever have any bats that you're unsure if you actually want them there or not. And keep in mind that some of these spots um, that you're seeing them during the summer on your property are actually places where there's groups of female bats raising their young. And so here's some pictures of baby bats. And it takes about three weeks for them to grow up and be able to fly on their own. So they're really dependent on their moms and their mom's survival. Um, so it's just a really sensitive period of time for them during the summer when their numbers are so low from, from diseases like white nose syndrome. The other thing I'll refer you to if you want to, if you're thinking about how you can help bats is to check out the species at risk guide for Nova Scotia. Um, it's free online. Um, we do sell them, but it's, it's just nice that you can get it for free online. And there's a few pages on the bats that are listed as endangered in Nova Scotia. So definitely check that out. And um, uh, there's a new study. I think it's, it's completed year two ish of it. And it's how, um, it's looking at what is the bat bat box in terms of what bats prefer. And so if you have a bat box or you're thinking of putting one up, one thing you can really do to get involved in bat conservation right now is participate in this study. So you just sign up, you send in data on the dimensions of your bat box, and then you keep track of if you see any bats in it. And they do want bat boxes that actually have no bats in them so they can figure out the difference between bats, bat boxes that are being used versus bat boxes that are not being used. And the, the reason this is really important is because we have recommendations out there right now that actually might not be accurate. Um, so some of the, the preliminary results um, suggest that these recommendations need to be updated. Um, an example I'll give you is that um, they found that occupied bat boxes tend to be tend to be about nine to 12 feet above the ground. And if you look at this list, um, they recommend up to 20 feet. So they're not, they don't need to be put as high as we thought. Um, some of the early results they're finding from the study from people who've participated are that bigger bat boxes tend to be occupied more often than smaller ones. So if you can put up a bigger box, that would be uh, uh, a good recommendation based off what they're finding so far. And there's a few other things that they found, but um, I'll refer you to uh, the newsletter from the project, um, April 2022. You can find this on the, on the project website and kind of hear some of the early results if you're thinking of putting up a bat box. And to finish up, um, we have the Nova Scotia reporting website, the Atlantic Canada bat hotline. Um, that also number is really, is really helpful for if you have any potential cases of contact with bats or um, health concerns. I know that people have wondered about COVID and bats and things like that. So they can answer a lot of questions there. And um, yeah, I'm gonna wrap up. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions though and talk more about these things and, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any um, anything you wanna talk about. My email is up on the screen right now and my phone number. And I'd like to take the time just to thank all the people that we work with. They don't have all their logos here, but um, we work with a variety of organizations to kind of help um, understand how bats are doing and learn more about them. And um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Lori. What an amazing talk. Um, there's a question in the chat uh, from Marg Mag Margaret. Uh, they want to know, will white nose eventually die out? I think the current thought is that it's probably going to continue to persist in North America and that eventually bats are going to hopefully coexist with it, but that's so far away that we don't know. Some of the early studies actually predicted some of these species to go extinct and not exist anymore. So hopefully there's some point in time in the future where, where bats that hibernate that are affected by this coexist. Um, 
one thing to think about too is that uh, in like China and Europe, the fungus that causes the disease is found naturally and bats are not dying off in mass numbers there. And so hopefully whatever's going on there is something that we get to and it just, it just might take a long time. Interesting. Um, so I was wondering, do uh, pseudomonosa destructants is that the fungus? Um, does yeah. it does it affect all bats? It doesn't affect all bats. So actually, some of these bats that migrate, so that like cool silver-haired bat in the flying photo from this year, um, so that bat doesn't actually get sick from the fungus. Um, some of these species that don't get sick, though, sometimes will test positive for it. So like a bat researcher will go up and swab and they'll say, oh, yeah, it's on here, but they don't actually have the symptoms. Um, so it is possible for some of these other species that don't get sick to actually to spread it potentially. Are there been like studies looking at why uh, other bats are more affected by the white nose uh, syndrome of and syndrome uh, fungus than uh, you know the other bats that can survive that um, syndrome and per and persist. Yes, that is like one of the biggest questions is just figuring out like why certain bats are are di like die off worse than others. Um, so it's kind of sad um, that we're seeing little brown bats kind of present in Nova Scotia, but the other bat that was second most common, the northern myota, so the northern long ear bat, we're not seeing that bat come back in small numbers, even starting numbers yet. And so we don't actually have the answer to why this bat is not doing as well. That bat is a forest dependent species, so we don't see it roosting in um, in in buildings and boxes and things like that. So it could be some of these other threats that are kind of compounded with white nose syndrome and that. But we actually don't have um, great answers to to exactly why certain species do better than others. Another example is big brown bats are larger and have bigger mass, and they tend to not be as affected by the fungus as little brown bats. So maybe bigger bats just have the co the coping skills or the size or the mass to kind of make it throughout the winter and be sick and, and get through and have the fat reserves to, to survive. Oh, I see. Um, Tina wants to know, will bats who have white nose bring that to a new bat house made for them and risk other bats getting it who may not have it? Okay, so we have uh, an honors student at Acadia University, Taryn, who's actually been looking at white nose syndrome um, in bats during the summer. And so she's testing um, them to figure out if they are positive for white nose syndrome. And I think that does include some bats in, in bat boxes. Um, we think though, like they are vulnerable when they come out of hibernation and go into bat boxes and then kind of that early period to still being sick or, or potentially not surviving. But hopefully by that point that things are warming up, they're getting more access to bugs and they have the resources to kind of make it through. Um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but yeah, it could potentially spread like if bats are coming from different places, one place where this bat's covered in the fungus not. I don't know if we have the specifics to that, but um, it is definitely potent something potentially that could happen. Hmm. Um, so when the bats uh, that do survive the winter and manage to escape uh, dying from that uh, fungus, does do they still carry that uh, fungus with them throughout the summer too? Um, not. They can they carry it at first, and then throughout the summer, the longer they've been away from their hibernation sites, they tend to if they're not going back and visiting them, there is the case where a bat could just like kind of pop back to there and come back. But generally, they're they're not have they're not testing positive for the fungus or having it present throughout the summer. And then once they start going back to those sites, kind of late summer, early fall, then they start testing positive again. Okay. Um, my grad wants to know is white nose always fatal in our bats no um not a uh, good question is probably probably more often fatal in the beginning i think bats now that are, are that i'm seeing and i'm counting and i'm monitoring um with some of these landowners probably have some resistance or tolerance or some genetic me mechanism that's allowing them to persist uh, one paper found that fat bats survive better, which I mean makes a lot of sense because if we think about a, a bear going to hibernation, the fatter it is, the probably the better it's going to do throughout the winter. And that's um, the same with bats that are sick from white nose syndrome. So um, 
I don't know the fatality rate now that it's really established here in Nova Scotia, but um, in some other places, they've seen numbers stabilize or even increase. So hopefully in the coming years, we can we can monitor for that and figure out how they're doing. Alex wants to know, did the last hurricane likely harm the bats even more? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I could check to see if we got any reports of anyone finding anything. Um, I don't know if I heard anything. I think this time of year, they kind of, most of them have left their summer sites and gone to their winter sites. So I wonder if that was really good timing and kind of provided them a bit more protection than some of their summer sites. I imagine <laughs> um, being in a tree was, wouldn't have been great, but um, hopefully a lot of them made it there. But yeah, if I, uh, if you want to follow up with me, I can double check and just see if anyone reported anything interesting from the hurricane. And I put Lori email in the chat too. If yeah, oh well, it's still on the screen there. If you want to get that and her number. Thank you. Um, Tom wants to know the map showing where uh WNS was located. Nova Scotia South Shore wasn't on it. Oh yes, okay. I know exactly what you're asking. So um when I showed the map of like Nova Scotia, we didn't have any documented cases of white nose syndrome on the South shore of Nova Scotia. And the reason for that is because we didn't have any, or we still don't have any hibernation sites where we could monitor for white nose syndrome in that area. So like no large cave or mine that is well documented for bats to use. So we could kind of track if white nose syndrome had spread there. So part of this honors project by Taryn is actually to test some of the bat colonies that we have. Um, so we have a, like a landowner in Lunenburg, um, and then I mentioned earlier that had 150 bats this summer. Uh, the student actually went and collected guano there, so we should actually get results to see if it's testing positive for white nose syndrome, and then that can actually be added to this map and better document for all of Nova Scotia if white nose syndrome is in all the counties, which I mean we probably suspect it is if if numbers are low, lower than we expected. Mm. Uh, Tina said thank you. Um, Brian wants to know, with such low population densities, how do we promote slash make bats aware of slash help bats find our bat boxes? Mm -hmm. um, okay, the quicker, the sooner you get them up, the better. Um, I In that bat box study, one of the things they found was that older boxes tended to be more likely occupied than new boxes. Um, so I would say that's the best thing. Just get your bat box up and be patient. Um, the older, the better. Um, I guess contributing. Yeah, I think I think we just have more to learn from this bat box study so we can have these better recommendations and then give bats what they want. So I would say participate in the study if you have a bat box or, or put one up and participate in the study. I think there's one more year. So like next summer after that will be the last year and then they'll put out the results and let us all know. Um, to make them more aware, one thing that isn't true that sometimes people ask is like, if you put guano in a bat box, will it attract other bats to it? And I think one research study found that wasn't true. So um, there might be multiple studies too, but uh, yeah, I think just um, giving bats lots of time and just uh, keeping an eye out for these recommendations so we can just kind of gear these boxes towards what they prefer most. Hmm. Another, I'll just, I'll, I'll also add that like one other, one other idea, um, that I've heard around the bat community is just like there's less bats so maybe bat boxes aren't as important if we have less of them but I think that bat boxes make it a bit easier for like the individual person to kind of participate in bat conservation and look for them but um yeah I think natural habitat is another important thing that if we have any impact on that that would be really really probably helpful to bats uh Tom says thank you so we, it looks like we're right on time. Um, thank you so much, Lori, for being with us tonight. Uh, what an amazing and really interesting talk. I'm inspired to get into action and do more to help bats. I don't have a bat box, but I will look into getting one up. <laughs> um, folks, if you don't have any questions, then we will leave it there for now. But if you have any questions, we will definitely make sure you get Lori's email. And if you're not following Nature Nova Scotia or MTRI on social media, definitely do and check out their website. Thank you so much again, Lori. And 
we will see you folks um, next Tuesday. So, well, not next Tuesday, the first Tuesday of next month, which is our next nature talk. Have a good night, everyone. Okay, Bye. thanks so much.